Manitoba's first round table for the Ontario election. Today, we're meeting with candidates for the NDP, um, Chandra Pasma of Ottawa West Nepean, my riding, and Melissa Con Conrad. Did I get that right, Melissa? Thank you. Um, welcome, Chandra and Melissa, and thank you to the members of the community who have joined us this morning. Our format today will be as follows. Our candidates will have up to two minutes um, strictly uh, for opening remarks. Um, uh, with appreciation to our communications and community relations committee members, they have prepared questions on issues of concern to the community that I will be posing and Chandra and Melissa will have an opportunity to answer. If you have a question for our candidates, uh, please submit them using the chat function to the moderator and Federation CEO Andrea Friedman will moderate a Q&A. After the Q&A, each candidate will have a brief opportunity for closing remarks. And I'd like to add that Melissa has a prior engagement at 8.30, so she will have to leave before we finish, but we thank you for joining us. Let's begin with our opening remarks and I'm going to ask Chandra to go first. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Sorry, still morning voice. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Chandra Pasma. I'm the Ontario NDP candidate in Ottawa West Nepean. I'm a policy, policy researcher, an activist, and a mom. And I want to start by acknowledging how difficult the past few years have been for everyone. We've really uh, been stretched to the limit between the crisis in health care and elder care, uh, but also the rising cost of living. And every day I hear from people how much they're struggling. The Ontario NDP has a plan uh, to make life better for Ontarians by fixing our health care system, uh, fixing our seniors care system so everyone gets the care that they deserve, but also making life more affordable by tackling the housing crisis, bringing down the cost of hydro and gas and groceries, uh, and expanding our health care system to include important things like mental health care, pharma care, and dental care. We also have a looming climate crisis and the International Panel on Climate Change has given us uh, now eight years to avoid catastrophic climate change and we're already seeing the effects in Ottawa West Nepean. We really can't afford to go backwards for the next four years and the NDP has a really exciting plan called the Green New Democratic Deal to tackle climate change. I also want to acknowledge that over the past few years, the coronavirus hasn't been the only virus we've been dealing with. We've been seeing the spreading virus of white supremacy across Canada. Uh, we really need to tackle the growing hate and anti-Semitism, and the NDP has a plan to tackle that hate so that everyone, no matter what they look like or where they worship, feels safe in, in Ontario. Uh, in 2018, I was also the NDP candidate in Ottawa, West Nepean, and came second by only 175 votes. This time we can get it done, so I'm asking for your support so that we can build an Ontario that's safe, healthy, and a great place to live for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chandra, and I clearly got your first name wrong, and I apologize for that. Um, Melissa, over to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Conrad, and I am the NDP candidate in Kanata Carleton. I'm a healthcare worker, a mom, and a longtime resident in Kanata. This is my third election running with the NDP, and each time we have increased the vote here in Kanata Carleton. I've been a labor activist for many years and union president representing 18 hospitals across Eastern Ontario, mediating positive resolve to issues that have arose. I'm in my third term on the Hospital Professionals Division Provincial Executive and have recently been elected to the Ontario Public Service Employees Union Executive Board. I am asking for your support for the NDP in my riding and all ridings to elect a government that works for you, that invests in the services that you need. An NDP government will reverse the Ford government cuts to healthcare, education, and social, social services like the autism program and many others. We will, we will make long-term care public not-for-profit to protect your loved ones. Mental health, dental care, and prescription medications are all part of overall health, and we will make them part of OHIP. We want to make sure that you only need your OHIP card and not your credit card at medical appointments. The NDP understands 
that if we invest in Ontarians today, we will have a thriving Ontario tomorrow. And that is why I am running for and stand behind the NDP platform. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I'd like to begin our questions. Um, uh, Chandra, you uh, you raised this earlier, and um, we all know that anti-Semitism and uh, racism and other forms of hate are on the rise. Um, we saw the horrible events in Buffalo over the weekend. Um, Jewish houses of worship, schools, childcare facilities, and community centers have been vandalized or attacked around the globe, often with dead, uh, deadly consequences, and Ontario is not immune. Um, our holidays and life cycle events in our province are often ha have to be celebrated with uh, paid duty police or security personnel guarding the doors. Worshippers and celebrants plan uh, toward a, uh, which exit they will run or where they will hide if an attacker enters the sanctuary. Ensuring safety in the, form, in the face of hatred is not a responsibility that should be borne by communities alone. It requires support from government. So um, the question, how will your party provide support for safety and security at community institutions such as houses of worship, community centers, schools, child care facilities, and summer camps? Um, well, uh, Chandra started first. We'll go to Melissa. Thank you so much. Yes, these are all things that I know um, that I have been hearing uh, in my community uh, from many different um, cultures and backgrounds. And I'm, I know that um, the NDP has brought forward um, things like the London Families Act to protect um, places of worship of all kinds, and that will really create safe spaces around places of worship. It's something that we, it's sad to say, but we need to have for people to be able to feel safe, whether it's a community gathering of their faith or whether it's a prayer time. And it's something that the NDP is uh, adamantly advocating for in government now, and we will continue to advocate for um, until it's no longer needed. And hopefully we get to that place because we understand that it's not any one specific faith background that is targeted. It is many and that everyone needs, deserves to feel safe. Thank you, Chandra. Yeah, this is something that's incredibly disturbing, the number of uh, hate motivated attacks that we've seen and the fact that they've been on the rise. Uh, you know, I'm a Christian who goes to church every Sunday. Currently, that's on Zoom, so that's not a problem. But I have never in my life uh, felt unsafe in church. I have never in my life come up with an exit strategy. I have never in my life needed security around church. Uh, there's, a, there's a real imbalance here and a real need to protect those who are most at risk. Uh, so the Ontario NDP has a plan to provide uh, for security costs uh, for religious communities, including installation of security cameras and the hiring of security guards. Uh, we also, as Melissa mentioned, have the Our London Family Act, which would create uh, safe zones around religious institutions to prevent intimidation or aggression. Now, obviously, harassment is always a crime, uh, but, you know, this adds an extra layer of protection uh, for those institutions that um, that means that uh, these crimes will be uh, aggressively prosecuted. But we also need to take action to prevent these crimes from developing and taking place in the first place. And the Ontario NDP has a plan to develop an anti-racism strategy and an action plan on hate crimes that will uh, ensure that we are preventing these crimes from taking place in the first place so that it's less about security and everybody has the freedom to worship or to participate in community events without fear. Thank you, Chandra. Um, one of the things I, I, I'd like to point out is that yes, all faiths and cultures need to feel safe in uh, their community spaces. Um, but um, uh, Statistics show that attacks uh, against the Jewish community are way out of proportion. I mean, many times 
the uh, proportion of the population represented by the, the Jewish community. Um, as an example, the Holocaust Knowledge and Awareness Survey conducted by the Claims Conference demonstrated that an alarming 62% of Canadian millennials were not aware that 6 million Jews were killed during the Holocaust and 22% have not heard or are unsure, uh, unsure if they have heard of the Holocaust at all. So, two questions. First, will your party draw on expert research and community input to ensure that anti-Semitism and Holocaust education are systematically integrated within educational curriculum and anti-racism initiatives? Um, Melissa, you first. Sorry, Chandra, you first. So as part of the Ontario NDP's anti-racism strategy, uh, it will involve a strategy par uh, particularly around schools um, to fight all forms of systemic racism so that all children feel safe, uh, including Jewish children. Um, but part of that strategy is uh, that students will learn about the history of the Holocaust uh, so that we fight this spread of Holocaust denial uh, and talk specifically about anti-Semitism uh, but the Ontario NDP also has the commitment to erect a Holocaust memorial on the grounds of Queen's Park so that it's not just within schools, uh, but everyone is reminded about uh, the awful uh, experience of the Holocaust and our commitment to never allow that to happen again. Thank you. Melissa? Yeah, I think that this is an extremely important um, issue in the schools. I, I did have the pleasure of connecting with some of the teachers unions, and this is something that they had actually brought up as something they would like to see in the schools for better understanding for their students and to have it part of the curriculum so they are able to openly discuss it and inform um, the kids about it. And, and be able to go on on field trips even um, to be able to better demonstrate and visualize for these students what it was like um, so they have the compassion and understanding when it comes to these kinds of things as they grow up and and won't have that disdain out of lack of knowledge so it's something that um, we're happy to offer to schools and have in schools and it seems it's being received very well by the teachers in the schools as well so um, this is something that i'm looking forward to being able to to implement um, with the NDP government. Thank you, Melissa. Um, second question on this topic. Um, as you both no doubt know, um, the government of Ontario adopted by order in council the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Will your party also commit to including Jewish Ontarians' current lived experience of anti-Semitism along with the IRA definition of anti-Semitism as a guide in a renewed provincial anti-racism strategy. Uh, let's go to Melissa first, please. Yeah, I think um, as a province, we always need to pull on lived experience um, because people who have that lived experience are best to help shape the future of what the education should look like, what the definition should look like. And so I think without that, it would be a disservice. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think that we need to draw on, on all Ontarians lived experience that we can. Chandra? So <clears throat> unfortunately, while Doug Ford did adopt the IRA definition, he also cut over $2 million from the anti-racism directorate and dismantled its working groups. And the NDP believes that it's only working with uh, affected communities that we will actually do the work of dismantling structural racism and anti-Semitism in Ontario. So in addition to renewing the, the anti-racism strategy, we're going to expand the anti-racism directorate into a full secretariat with a, a minister who is responsible for anti-racism. And we will reinstate the working groups, including the working group on anti-racism, so that we give communities, including the Jewish community, a direct say in the operation and the development of the strategy. Uh, we will also take on white supremacist groups in Ontario, uh, taking away their ability to operate in the province, for instance, by ensuring that no hate groups are able to receive not-for-profit status and collect data on hate crimes so that we're developing the most robust strategy we can in cooperation with communities. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and thank you both for addressing these critical issues for us. We'll now move on to some very different topics. Uh, Jewish Ontarians have worked tirelessly to make Ontario a great province in which to live and grow old. They deserve to age in dignity within their communities. Ethnocultural long-term care homes like Hillel Lodge in Ottawa are key parts of Ontario's long-term care system and provide seniors with culturally appropriate care. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed several systemic challenges facing long-term care in our province, including the sustainability of culturally appropriate care. And so the question, um, how will your party safeguard the sustainability and accessibility of culturally appropriate long-term care and ensure admissions policies more effectively pri uh, prioritize cultural, uh, culturally appropriate care? Um, Chandra, first to you. Thanks, Michael. I want to start by acknowledging what an absolute tragedy has unfolded in seniors care over the past uh, couple years. Uh, we saw unacceptable suffering and death, uh, including here in Ottawa, West Nepean at Collingview Manor, where one in five residents uh, lost their lives during the pandemic. And those are tragedies, each and every one, and have left gaping holes in every family. Uh, and we really need to change how we approach care for our elders and for people living with disability in the province. The NDP has a comprehensive plan to overhaul how we provide that care, uh, starting with removing the profit from the system. Uh, so there will be no more for-profit home care or long-term care in Ontario. We're gonna make significant investments in home care, uh, recognizing, uh, I'm sure Melissa has had a similar experience, but as I've been knocking on doors for the past nine months, I haven't met anyone who wants to move into long-term care, especially not after what has happened. What they really want to do is stay in their own homes as long as possible, but they need the services and supports that are going to keep them there. So we're going to expand home care, uh, make it uh, community-based and not-for-profit and regulate the services that people receive so that everyone receives the same high level of care. Uh, for some people, that is medical care. For others, it could include things like meal preparation. Uh, and because it's community-based, there would be a role for uh, community-based social services like Jewish community services to provide that home care uh, so that you know if someone was getting meal preparation, for instance, it could be kosher meal uh, preparation. Uh, when people do need that additional level of care, uh, what we want to do is change the model of long-term care, uh, again, to be public and not-for-profit more family oriented instead of these giant institutions that warehouse seniors and people living with disabilities. Um, but obviously a significant part of providing that decent care is culturally appropriate care in someone's own language uh, so that they don't at the end of their life suddenly have to eat unfamiliar uh, foods or foods that are not religiously appropriate or that they're not able to receive uh, religious care. Uh, or they're not able to practice activities that are familiar to them. Uh, so groups uh, like uh, Hillel uh, and others have a really important role within the NDP's plan in providing that community-based long-term care that is going to make seniors feel most comfortable. And our, we will uh, invest a significant amount of money in ensuring that that is the high quality level of care that our seniors and people living with disability receive. Um just before we go to Melissa, a, a quick um, uh, editorial and proud comment. Our Hillel Lodge performed extraordinarily well over the last uh, over two years now um, with a COVID epidemic. And uh, for the most part, um, for the vast most part, um, our, uh, our seniors were well cared for. Well, they were all well cared for, but um, given the stories that were uh, coming out, uh, they were safe. Uh, Melissa? Can I just add that, I mean, what we've seen really is that that profit role played a huge part in the tragedy in long-term care because money was not going towards care. It was being taken out of the system, but also the for-profit institutions have an incentive to cram as many people in as they can, which meant more people in older rooms. Uh, and that contributed directly to the spread. It also meant workers being given part-time and temporary positions instead of full-time work in one institution. Uh, and so that's why it's so important that we get for-profit care out. And that's why it makes a really big difference when it's not for-profit community-based care, because you know the motivating uh, 
rationale of Hillel and other community-based providers really is care. It's not money in the pockets of shareholders. Melissa? Yeah, I don't have too much to add to what Chandra said. That was a very robust answer. But the one thing I will add that I'm really looking forward to seeing in this province, and it has started, but not very much, is building the smaller family style care homes instead of the institutional style homes, which will make it easier um, for people to uh, find culturally appropriate representative homes where they can stay with like-minded families, like-minded people, and continue on with their, with their face and with food requirements. It also has been proven that in these smaller family-like homes where you sit around um, a more dining table experience rather than a cafeteria style experience, um, that our loved ones do stay healthier, they live longer, they are on less medications, they have better mental health. It has been proven over years that we have had a few of these small community-based style homes um, that the well-being of family members is, is far greater than in institutional style homes and the care is far greater. So to take these homes and um, have the care base instead of the profit base and then have it culturally relevant to what families require um, will really add to that comfort and sense of stability for our loved ones going forward. And so that's something that the Ontario NDP is very much in favor of. I know I've worked a lot with the Ontario Health Coalition that has been trying to um, push this forward for the last four years uh, to no avail with the current government. So um, I'm looking forward to taking the information, the credible um, information that we have and implementing it into these homes and making sure that we have um, just really great um, you know, care for people when they need it, when they do, when they do need to leave their homes. Thank you. Um, the uh, last of the scripted questions. Poverty in the Jewish community has been on the rise in Ontario for decades. One of the most concerning trends is food insecurity amongst Jewish seniors in Ontario who are unable to access affordable kosher food. Will your party provide support to ethno-cultural meals on wheels programs to help address food insecurity for the most vulnerable? Uh, Melissa, over to you. Okay, I'm just going to give a quick answer on this. I really need to hop off, but um, um, yeah, I think that I think that that's part of you know that's part of home care. That's part of investing in our seniors being able to stay home is being able to have the access to culturally relevant foods um, and care so that people can get in home care in the language that they speak dominantly, as well as having someone that will respect their culture and their faith when they come into their home. So the Meals on Wheels program program is part of that. And we do know that um, it needs some investment right now to expand and to maintain with cost of everything rising. And that's something that um, we think is very important uh, in efforts to keep seniors home as long as possible and with the um, highest respect and care that we can offer them um, in their home so long as they can stay there. Thank you so much for having me. I am Thanks going to talk off. Us, I appreciate Bye. Chandra, over to you. Same question. Yeah, so what I will add, I mean, obviously there are always going to be people who need some meal support, as Melissa mentioned, to stay in their own home, and that, that is part of home care. But I also wanna address the affordability side of things because absolutely, it is becoming harder for people to afford decent food. People are being squeezed on both sides, the income side and uh, the cost of living side. I know that things have been really difficult for many people over the past two years. Uh, many people have ended up depleting their savings because of it. Uh, so we really need to address the cost of living and make it easier for everyone to afford decent food along with decent housing, uh, regardless of what their circumstances are. So the Ontario NDP does have a plan for a food strategy uh, to ensure that everybody has access to affordable, high quality food. Uh, part of that is addressing the cost of groceries through addressing the cost of gas. Uh, so we have a plan to regulate gas prices, which will bring them down, uh, stop gouging at the gas pumps and lower the cost of transporting those groceries. Uh, for many people, their biggest cost is actually the cost of housing. We've had a real crisis develop in Ontario. 
uh, whether people own or rent, uh, housing has become incredibly unaffordable. I hear heartbreaking stories every day from people who are not uh, sure uh, they're going to be able to maintain their current uh, residence and what will happen to them next, uh, what they might be able to afford and where they might have to go in order to be able to find affordable housing. So the NDP has a plan uh, to address the housing crisis that makes it more affordable both on both sides, whether you rent or own. So for renters, that means reinstating rent control and vacancy control so that you pay what the last tenant paid and your landlord has no incentive to squeeze you out because the people down the hall are paying $500 a month more and they might get more money from the next tenant, but also expanding the supply of affordable homes. So directly investing in uh, social housing and non-market rental housing uh, through the creation of a public agency in Ontario that would be responsible for that expanding the amount of co-op housing in Ontario, uh, but also uh, removing exclusionary zoning. So uh, we can develop more affordable homes, including the missing middle. So duplexes, triplexes, stacked townhomes instead of uh, just monster uh, single family homes on giant lots. Um, but also on the income side, we have another a number of measures, including setting the minimum wage at $20 an hour and doubling social assistance rates so that uh, the people who are the most vulnerable uh, can actually afford to pay food, pay for the bills, and pay rent. Okay, um, thank you for your answers. Um, we will now move to the open forum Q&A moderated by Federation CEO Andrea Friedman. Um, as a reminder to those watching, please submit your questions in the chat to the moderator and Andrea will do her best to get to everyone. Andrea, good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, our first question comes from Sarah Caspi, who's the Executive Director of Jewish Family Services. And she's rightly uh, very concerned um, and advocating for an increase to free mental health supports, an increase to community services for all seniors, and an increase in capacity building so that they can continue to meet these important needs. She's curious to better understand how the NDP platform proposes to support the mental health newcomer and senior needs of the clients that they serve. Thanks, Andrea. So the mental health platform of the ONDP is one of the things that I'm really excited about. Uh, as I've been knocking on doors for the past eight months, I've really heard how much people have been struggling because of the pandemic. And as a parent, I've seen it too. Uh, some of my own kids needed therapy to get past the to get through the past couple of years, uh, given everything that we have put on our children. Uh, you know, I'm sure for many seniors, they've also been dealing with isolation uh, and for newcomers, a difficult time to integrate into our country. Um, but we have this great disparity in mental health service right now where those who have good employment benefits have decent access to mental health care. When my kids needed to speak to someone, I was able to, to find someone almost immediately because I have really good employer provided benefits. But I've spoken with so many parents who have had their kids on wait lists for 12 or 18 months for the little bit of public care that's provided. And mostly what we provide publicly in Ontario is care only when someone reaches a crisis level. So only when they need hospitalization do we provide any public mental health support for them. So what we want to do is bring mental health care into OHIP so that everybody receives the mental health care that they need with their health card, not their credit card. Uh, and I know this wasn't part of the question, but I just want to address specifically for kids, because this is also part of our plan, recognizing how much they've struggled. So in addition to the mental health care provided through OHIP, we also want to hire additional mental health workers for schools so that problems get quickly identified and addressed for kids as they make up for the last three years of disrupted schooling. Uh, in, in for others, um, definitely there's a lot of communities that are struggling and we need to provide those community supports. We need to make sure that everybody has access to housing. Uh, you know, I've seen lots of friends and neighbors uh, sponsoring Ukrainians right now. One of the biggest concerns is always, always finding affordable housing. Uh, we need to make sure that that housing is available for everyone, uh, regardless of which community they come from, because uh, that's really where security starts from and then making sure that we have the other supports in place. So access to decent food, addressing the cost of living and making sure that everyone has what they need to thrive in Ontario. Thank you for that. 
I guess the flip side to all these investments that are um, needed and that the, are in the NDP's platform around um, social investments are, are how to pay for it. And that's really uh, Michael Korber's question, which is, um, can you perhaps address the revenues of where, where this will come from uh, to pay for all these enhanced social supports? Yeah, cost is such an important question because right now what we have is a situation where the costs of underinvestment by liberal and conservative governments are being imposed on those who can least afford to pay them. So every day I speak to somebody who has a story about waiting 10 to 12 hours at the Queensway Carlton Hospital for health care, uh, stories about people who have called ambulances and they haven't come. We've seen the toll imposed on our seniors and on our kids uh, of not investing in health care and seniors care and education. What the NDP believes is that those in our society who can most afford to pay should be paying the cost, not those who can least afford to pay. So we have a tax freeze on individuals earning less than $200,000, but we're going to expect those who have profited from the pandemic and from our housing crisis to pay more. Uh, so that does include uh, tax increases on the highest income earners, but also on activities like speculation in the housing market, which have been driving up housing costs without actually providing homes for anyone. Sorry, I'm just trying to uh, thank you for that. It's uh, <laughs> challenging to see people are putting questions in two different places. Um, right. So uh, I think um, there's a couple of questions that kind of have some similarities to it. And um, you know, before I ask them, I just wanna express how grateful we are to you for, for making the time today um, for us. The reason why I express that gratitude again is that there is a feeling um, that the NDP uh, is quite anti-Israel uh, and supports BDS and perhaps isn't particularly a strong ally of the Jewish community. And so I'm gonna give you the opportunity to kind of address um, those concerns um, to try to make people feel more comfortable that the NDP is an ally of the Jewish community. First of all, the NDP doesn't support BDS. Uh, there was a resolution, I want to say in 2017 or 2018 at the federal convention, but it was defeated. Uh, so there is no uh, there is no policy statement from the NDP in support of BDS. Uh, what the federal NDP supports is a two state solution that would end the violence in the Middle East. Uh, but there are many many Jewish voices within the NDP, uh, including some of our founding families like the Lewis family. Uh, there's a robust debate, I would say, on the best way forward uh, for Israel. Uh, but a strong commitment in the NDP that anti-Semitism is never acceptable and that uh, combating anti-Semitism needs to be one of our priorities as a government, along with combating other forms of hate so that everyone feels safe in Ontario, feels welcomed in Ontario, feels welcomed within the Ontario NDP. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, may I just ask your personal position on BDS? I'm not in favor. Thank you for being crystal clear about that. I really appreciate it. Um, so just one perhaps final question on, on this topic. And, and uh, you said it very clearly a second ago that the federal NDP supports a two-state solution, um, as does the, the Jewish community. Um, the question that I would have, and, and you spoke about um, anti-Semitism in terms of white supremacists and from the right, and that is a, a very significant, significant challenge. But I think what many in the Jewish community are also feeling now is that there's anti-Semitism from the left. Um, and it all pertains to Israel and not allowing Jews to live their full authentic true self, which includes a strong affinity and identification with the people in state of Israel. Just this Friday, we saw a, a walkout at a school um, in Ottawa where they had signs that said from the river to the sea, which is a euphemism for a one state solution, um, which eliminates the state of Israel and, and really caused for the death and destructions of, of Israelis. So I'm wondering if you can maybe comment a little bit about how if you are in government and clearly have articulated that you're not in support of BDS, which we're, we're grateful for, how do you work to combat some of that anti-Semitism from the left, including from uh, some members of the NDP caucus? Well, I, like I said, there's lots of voices within the NDP. Uh, some of the criticism of the state of Israel is coming from Jewish voices within the NDP. I don't think it's my place as a, as a non-Jewish person uh, to tell them they have no right to say that. I think the important thing is to engage in the debate uh, forthrightly and transparently, being honest about the impacts on others and make sure that we end up in a place where everyone feels safe in Ontario. 
safe to participate in dialogue, safe to participate in debate. Uh, you know, specifically on the question of Israel, uh, there is no foreign uh, policy within uh, provincial jurisdiction, uh, so that won't be part of the debate, but uh, definitely building in Ontario where everybody feels safe and everybody can participate. Thank you. Um, so again, I'll remind people if they have additional questions, we have a, a little bit more time. And while people uh, perhaps give a little more thought to that, I will ask a much easier question for you, um, which is just you, you mentioned that you've run, you've run before, and I really applaud you for, for, for this dedication. What, what running, running in any election is not easy. Um, it involves a tremendous amount of work, probably several pairs of, of shoes as you pound <laughs> the pavement. Um, what, what is your strong motivation to, to keep going? Well, I decided to run in 2018 because I was concerned about the state of our province at the time. It was already clear that we had a broken education and healthcare system and then the looming threat of climate change. Uh, but Doug Ford has really taken us backwards on all, all of these important areas over the past four years. I have three kids. Uh, they're 11 and then nine-year-old twins. Uh, they're lovely, smart, funny, engaging kids. I really care about what's going to happen to them in the future. And it's just incredible to me that we would build a society that doesn't take care of one another, that allows people to be unhoused, allows people to struggle without adequate income, allows the climate to be destroyed around us and that we don't do anything about that. I, I really, really believe in community solidarity, really believe in working together on the major challenges that we face. and. Uh, you know, because this is a faith-based group, I will also share that my own faith is a big part of my motivation in this. Uh, so I grew up, uh, I grew up in a Calvinist dom denomination. I'm now Anglican, but I, I really feel uh, a strong sense of uh, calling as part of as part of being a person of faith to do what I can uh, to make the world a better place. I know you have a similar concept in the Jewish faith of Tikkun Olam, of healing the world. Uh, and so, you know, that, that, that's what I feel. If, if I can do something, I must do something. That's part of my calling as a person of faith. Well, that's great. And thank you for sharing a bit more about yourself um, personally, in addition Andrea, to uh, advocating yeah. on the positions that are important to you. Um, Andrea, if I may, I, I, I have another question that, uh, that I'd like to ask. Oh, sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Brownie Point Chandra for getting to Kun Alam. Um, um, uh, you know, that wasn't in our final Jeopardy round, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but thank you for that. Um, this is completely off the wall, but you, 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 you mentioned we were talking about the election campaign and, and um, um, extra Brownie points as well for doing this with twins. Um, that's... <laughs> um, uh, not an easy thing, um, but it, it has been a, a question that has occurred to me, not unique to the NDP, um, uh, uh, but um, I've been disturbed at the continuing proliferation of election signs um, and everywhere. And I look at them and I think that they are a giant waste of wood and paper um, and a giant waste of financial resources for uh, election uh, for uh, election campaigns. I, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the um, proliferation of election campaigns, and not so much on on people's lawns, because I think that you know when you see your neighbors making a particular decision, that's one thing. But it's you know it's the corners, and and you know I'm in your riding. Um, uh, I passed about a zillion campaign signs uh, driving out of Center Point down Baseline Road to the 417 this morning. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about whether we ought to cut back on election signs. I am with you 100%, Michael. <laughs> they are expensive. They're not beautiful to see all over your riding. They're not environmentally friendly. But the challenge is that uh, as long as one candidate does them, every candidate has to do them. Uh, so what it's going to take to eliminate them is a municipal bylaw or no signs. So if that's what you, you know, there's a municipal election coming up next, that might be an opportune time to start lobbying uh, candidates for that election to convince them that we need a bylaw in Ottawa. But it's, uh, 
it, it unfortunately is something that you just have to participate in as part of the game until we all agree we're not going to do it anymore. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I guess we'll, we'll turn that one to the municipal election coming up in the fall. Um, one, one of the attendees who's, uh, who's, who's with us this morning um, wants to talk a little bit more about anti-Semitism. And I think you see that in a lot of the questions. There's concern about anti-Semitism and about Israel. And um, specifically related, um, not so much to educating youth about anti-Semitism, which is really important, but what's your position on um, punishment when hate crimes do occur? Uh, like, should there be additional punishment for hate crimes or? So just, you know, when a hate crime occurs and the person perpetrating it is, is, is caught, what do you think is an appropriate process um, in our judicial system? Well, I think it should be identified as a hate crime, uh, both that that should be taken into consideration in sentencing, but also that uh, having an identification of hate crimes allows us to track hate crimes uh, better understand what is happening and hopefully develop a plan to prevent it from occurring. Um, it is also part of the NDP's plan to require mandatory uh, training on uh, racism and uh, bias for uh, public officials, which would include judges, uh, police officers, but also other public officials who interact with the public uh, legislators in, uh, in Queen's Park. Uh, so that we have a clear understanding of what hate looks like when we see it and uh, are able to clearly identify that. So thank you for that. Um, shifting gears uh, to the environment. Um, and one of the attendees this morning would like to understand a little bit more about the environmental facets of the NDP plan, such as supports for home energy retrofits and electric vehicle rebates. How will this be something that everyone can access? That's a very good question. So uh, it is low income communities, racialized communities and new in newcomer communities who will be most impacted by climate change. And if we don't take care in addressing climate change, we also risk leaving those communities behind. So in developing the Green New Democratic Deal, the Ontario NDP has really centered the values, the values of equity and reconciliation so that everybody uh, low income, Black, Indigenous, uh, racialized newcomers to Canada gets to share in the benefits of addressing climate change because addressing climate change is not just about costs. It's a win-win-win because we also create new green jobs, uh, but people will also be able to reap the benefits of energy savings as we retrofit homes and create zero emissions vehicles. So the Ontario NDP has a plan to reach net zero by 2050. That includes retrofitting all buildings in Ontario. So, you know, right now the federal and municipal plans that exist mostly target individual homeowners. Uh, but what we really need to do is ensure that every building is retrofitted to reduce emissions. Uh, so our plan also includes public buildings, businesses, and apartment buildings and condos. Uh, so there will be support for, uh, for the home retrofit which as I mentioned, will then reduce energy costs to heat and cool your home. Uh, we also have a plan to expand zero emission vehicles manufacturing in Ontario. Uh, right now, there's not the supply to meet the demand that already exists. Uh, if you try to buy an electric vehicle in Ontario right now, you'll probably be put on a three year wait list. Uh, so we need more people driving zero emissions vehicles, but we need to make sure that we're not driving up the cost and making it something that only the wealthiest can afford. Uh, we do have a subsidy for electric vehicles uh, to make it more affordable for everyone, but that doesn't include the luxury vehicles. So if you're looking to buy a Tesla, then sorry, this platform is not for you, uh, but also support for the installation of the charging stations within your own home, uh, as well as investments in clean tech uh, so that we're reducing emissions in other ways, uh, but also municipal transit. Uh, recognizing that not everybody can afford to buy a car, not everybody wants to buy a car, and probably not everybody should have a car. Uh, right now, uh, if you try to take OC Transpo, it can be a living nightmare um, because the service is so scarce and the train may or may not run depending on how hot it is and whether the wheels are currently round. Um, so the Ontario NDP plans to cover 50% of the costs for municipalities of public transit so that we can both make it more affordable, uh, but also expand coverage so that it's actually a usable service and electrify it so that we're lowering the emissions for it. Terrific. 
Thank you so much. Um, Michael, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Just finding the unmute button. <laughs> um, thank you uh, to all of our participants who submitted questions. And Chandra, thank you for your answers. Um, now over to you for closing remarks. Well, thank you so much for hosting this forum today. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk about the issues that really matter to you. Uh, I promise that if I win, uh, this will not be the last you hear from me. There will be many such more meetings uh, where I can come and hear from you what is important to you and how we can work together and share what's happening at Queen's Park and in the riding, uh, because I really want to be an ally to your community and work with you to build and fix what matters most to you. So thank you again for taking the time. Thank you, and I didn't even have to um, uh, uh, remind you about a time limit that uh, a politician with an unlimited time who speaks briefly is an unusual thing. Um, so thank you. And um, uh, we knew that this was a hectic time for you, but with three of three kids, uh, a, a pair of them twins, uh, this is a hectic time for you. And we appreciate you making the time to be with us um, this morning. Uh, thank you to Andrea. Thank you to uh, those who have been watching and submitting questions. Um, thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Good luck out there. How many pairs of shoes have you been through? I'm only on my second. Okay. There's still time before yeah. June the second. The second well, may be done before then too. <laughs> have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you too. Okay. Bye-bye.